Welcome to the Husky Robotics Leadership Workshop Series. Uh, to let everyone know, we are recording and will later share a video of tonight's session. Um, one thing I've been starting each of these sessions with is a reminder that uh, for some of you, this is, is your fourth leadership workshop. Um, there, with these particular presentations, uh, some of this material will be familiar, some of this material is brand new. Um, but regardless, um, it's all of it is new to someone, um, and uh, some of it is a reminder for for others. And so, just keep that in mind um, as we go through this evening. And um, in the breakout rooms, when we're sharing out, um, it's an opportunity for those of you who have have seen more of this to to model the behaviors um, and leave some room for for others to uh, try as well. Um, we're going to see many things here. Uh, from uh, Jubin and from Mr. MG, which are going to be uh, potentially really helpful for the upcoming season. So remember that these leadership workshops isn't the end of anything, it's just the beginning. Um, and that uh, they are available for follow-up questions. All of us can work together on these topics, um, whether during a regular meeting or, or during Robots After Dark or any other time. Um, and so uh, tonight's workshop, we've got two parts. Um, we're going to start with Juvin, and then we'll transition over to Mr. MG a little bit later. Um, and so uh, go ahead and, and take it away. Sure, thank you. Uh, quick note, today's presentation is being shared by Jack, Elena, and myself. So they've been kind enough to step up and participate, so thank you for that. Today's workshop, we will cover project management and execution. So though it says project management at the high level, it's more from a leadership perspective, as well as the participation from the team perspective. So you will get to know a lot. A lot of it might be sounding a bit of a repetition as Mr. Schmidt said, but nevertheless, it's good to go over the key concepts. So what is project management? in general, right? And there are multiple definitions again. Uh, this is the one that is succinct and clear. So project management is the process of leading the work of a team to achieve all the project goals within the given constraints. With that, we did speak about this in terms of the keywords. However, let's hear from the team again, what they think about in definition, what are the keywords which appeal to the team today? So go off mute and just speak up. No need to raise the hand. I think project management is leading. Leading, that's true. Leading by example, removing constraints. Dylan, you want to take a shot? What appeals to you in the definition? Uh, I think project management is kind of like managing a group of people and sort of helping them find a way to achieve certain goal or something like that. Thank you for that. Tyler. Yeah, I think it's like, Hello. 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 Yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, I think it's more like uh, you're managing a project and like guiding it through its process, keeping track of keeping track of who's working on it and what's going on. Something happens, you kind of kind of report that. Sure. Olivia, you want to take a shot too? Um, I think it's really just making sure all parts of a project comes together to equal the final goal. Could you repeat the last part? Sorry. I think it's making sure all parts of the project come together to uh, reach a common goal at the end and communicating um, the shared goals with each part of the project. Yes, makes sense. Thank you for that. And also, we need to be aware of our constraints, right? So our constraints could be time, constraints should, could be cost, 
and strengths could be knowledge, skills. So thank you for participating. That was wonderful. So just uh, it's about leading. It's about participation when we talk about the execution part. It's about teamwork, achieving the project goals, and obviously being aware of the constraints. Thank you for that. So why is project management very important for us? And how do we within the Husky's team do it? So we'll, we'll talk more about it throughout the session here. So I just wanted to share one example, which I did last year. I checked that that example sounded really well. So I'm going to just go ahead and repeat the, the example from last year again. So here's the constraint, right? If say we have to reach a distance of half a mile and the constraint is we don't have a car and the other constraint is we have to make it in say seven or eight minutes, how would we cover that distance of half a mile? What are the ways we can cover that? Samika. Um, you could drive. The constraint is we don't have a car. Oh, uh, you could bike. Yeah, bike or else. Yeah, Aaron, please go ahead. If we don't have a car, we can try and get a bus. Okay. Definitely. We can take a bus. We could walk. Okay, so let's extend the constraint now. <clears throat> Say we have to cover two miles, but we have 30 minutes. What will we do? Lara. Um, I would probably try and see if somebody else could give me a ride to get where I needed to go. Okay. What else? Jake? Um, I mean, that's what I was thinking about getting a ride or something like that. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's about solutioning also. So thank you for that. Now, we don't have any constraint. We have to travel, say, for 50 in an hour. What would we do? How do we reach there? Emma, you want to take a shot? Simi? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? You cut out. Sure, sure. Assuming we have to travel a distance of in an hour, we don't have a constraint of a car. What are the ways we can reach? Like cover those 50, uh, 50 miles. Uh, maybe call a cab or an Uber. Okay. And okay, thank you. And then say we have to cover 800 miles in two hours. Then how do we reach there? Fly. Fly. Yep. Perfect. So based on the goals that we have, the way we work or the way we deploy the technologies or the way we reach our goal differs, right? So with that, I'm going to hand over the next slide to Jack. Go ahead, Jack. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jubin. Um, to talk more on goals, what is one goal that we have for our team, specifically regarding the robot? Like where do we want to, or what do we want to accomplish by building our robot? Can anybody can hop in for this one? Aaron? Well, I believe, well, the first goal is for one, trying to take a problem, solve it, and create something new to build off of next time. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one. Does anybody know what competition we might be trying to strive for? Specifically one in maybe Texas? World Is championship. Yeah. Worlds. Worlds, that's a great one. So one of our team goals is going to Worlds. And to consider that, we this is one of our strategies of looking at the end and keeping the end in mind when planning out 
how we're going to get there, which we will touch on more later. But to do that, we have to build a highly participative team and a high performing team. And what that means is we have to have attention to detail in what we're doing to make sure that we're maximizing our efficiency and communicating within our team so we don't make mistakes that are easily avoidable. And we want to make sure our eyes are focused on the goal and that we're also focusing on what we need to do to actually get there instead of just, we want to go to Worlds. We want to know what we have to do to get to Worlds. Right. Thank you. So attention to detail, communication, following the process or the steps required are important. So thank you, Jack, for that. All right, so what is key for everyone on the team? And what are the values that the team needs to imbibe? One is be transparent and respectful. So if you're constrained, if you have a challenge, let's bring it up transparently. Let's respectfully work with everybody to encourage them to participate, encourage them to uh, bring their full extent to the team, maximize efficiency and productivity. Obviously, we have a large team, so we could do a lot given the time constraints we have or given the knowledge constraints we have. So it would be good to find how we can be all productive. It's also about leadership and team dynamics. So it's just not about leadership, how the team evolves and works with each other in the various uh, <clears throat> features that we work on or the various sub teams that we work on that also will evolve. And it makes sense to just keep adapting to the change that's needed. The robot feature, also the way we work, that's really key, right? So we will keep adapt, adapting to the change or the situation at hand. We will strive to overcome all obstacles. If possible, recognize the constraints. We will make improve, uh, incremental improvements on the robot. We will in, do incremental improvements in the way we work and help try to reach our goals. We do have a workshop coming up next week about measurable goals, but we will cover a quick exercise to just kind of uh, drive the message home. And then the one part is focusing on our measurements. Obviously, smart goals are there, but also the outcome of the various activities we do in terms of measurement and prototype and data collection is going to be key for us. So with that, Elena, can I hand it over to you? Are you ready? Yeah. Me and Jack are ready. Um, awesome. You're ready to share. Do, I will start sharing after we do the uh, skit, if you'd like. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's I'm ready. Hey, Elena. Did you run the test for the prototype for the shooter feature last night? Yeah, I did. Great. Did you remember to record the test for how fast the shooter was? Yeah, I looked, I, in our, I looked in our team's folder and I couldn't find it. Yeah, I ran some of the tests and I noted down the measurements. That's awesome. Can I see it? Um, yeah, but it's on my phone. I put it in my notes app last night. Oh, well, I thought we agreed you were going to make a Google spreadsheet with recorded measurements and put it in our team's folder so that everyone can see it. Yeah, but this was just so much easier. I was running the test and my phone was right there. So I just put it on my phone. Yes, but when you do it that way, no one else can see what the results are and which prototype design we should select for our final submission. Can you please make a subtracted, or a, <clears throat> sorry, structured test result sheet and record all your results in there and put it in our team's folders? Yeah, that makes sense now. I'll make a spreadsheet right now. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, so as you can see by that great skit, there is a lot of value in actually making an important spreadsheet. So we're going to talk about that and the importance of prototyping right now. Oh. One sec. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? we can. Okay, great. So um, as you guys know, uh, each season we kind of take part of our design process is 
uh, data collection and prototyping. And prototyping is officially defined as a method of obtaining early feedback on requirements by providing a model of the expected product before building it. Um, and this is really connected to project management because the ultimate goal of product management is to have a product at the end, which is our robot that matches our kind of product owners requirements, which is our strategy team's requirements and our own requirements as a team in order to achieve our goals. And prototyping serves as a great way to check in and make sure that the ideas we're coming up with and the work we're doing matches these goals. So the first most important thing um, when looking at prototyping and data collection is formulating the right questions. Um, so usually uh, data collection and prototyping would be centered around the features that we have on our robot. So for example, last year, the shooter formulated um, a list of questions and then put them in a spreadsheet or more in like a table and then, um, and then use prototyping in order to answer these questions. So some examples are, can you guys see um, this new Google doc? Yep. Yes. All right, great. Um, so some examples are motor speed and we had compression. We had distance away from um, the shooter or from the hub, the velocity of the ball and a lot of different stuff like that. So when prototyping, it's really important that your design looks to answer these questions as efficiently as possible. Um, and then once these um, are formulated, um, we go to create a spreadsheet. And something that's important to note is that um, usually the FPMs will be in charge of, the future project managers will be in charge of creating um, and kind of managing the prototyping. But as a whole team, we are responsible in helping that and helping execute that. So a great way to do that is for FPMs to ask for help from people who have you know, prototype before or done spreadsheets before um, in order to develop something like this. Um, and so this is a combined document of our future prototyping testing data, or at least the ones that we did end up doing prototyping for last season, which were the intake for uh, Sierra and also the shooter. So as you can see here, um, this is for three bar testing and over here is two bar testing, but I don't know if this has that much info. Um, and obviously these are gonna be specialized for each feature based on the necessary components. As you can see, shooters a little bit different. Um, and although it looks overwhelming at first, some cool features that um, are great to implement in order to kind of further decision-making process is filters. So as you can see here, um, these are all like, you know, the example prototyping data. And when you go over here, you can choose which um, options you want. So for looking at all the good ones, I guess there are a lot, but we ended up choosing this highlighted one at the end. And so basically making these spreadsheets helps that everyone on the team, if they wanted to know the prototyping status could go onto here. And also it's a great way to track um, our decisions and just have the most informed design process. Um, and so again, ask for help. Keep in mind that that is important. Um, and then finally, um, if you guys were here last season or if you're coming for, from another team or you're new, um, in the past, our prototyping has been, you know, pretty minimal um, to the extent of just a bar and like some wheels on a shooter. And it hasn't been focused on formulating and answering um, specific questions and really helping our product along as much as it could have. Um, and then this past season, we really invested um, a kind of a considerable amount of time in prototyping because it was a new thing to the point that it actually caused us to stall and not um, reach some of our goals as efficiently as we could have. So our goals coming into this next season are to find a balance between this and answer and formulate questions really efficiently, but also um, spend enough time on the design process to help us later in the future. Yeah. That was great. Thank you, Elena. And just to share with the team now, we do have a few experts uh, uh, from the team who use Google Sheets, that's Shresha, Mars, Andrea, Helena, Jack, and Raj. So if you have any questions, by all means, please go ahead and uh, ask them for any help uh, for using any of those features. All right, uh, so let's do one quick exercise about the measurable goals. As I said, next week's session is fully focused on the goals. However, I wanted to make sure we encourage measurable goals for a few of the subcomponents or features that we, uh, we that we will build for, right? That's really going to be important because that will give us a good goal 
that will devise a way for us to think efficiently, creatively, for us to reach a goal, right? And how will that help us? So if a subset of the robot, say a feature, is going to work in a certain manner, it will help us in building a efficient robot, a high-performing robot, indirectly by having a, a excellent feature. So it could be a feature for collection. It could be a feature for shooting, as an example. So here's one example of what is not going to be measurable, as an example. Right? So we want to build a fast car. It doesn't say how fast. So a specific example is a stationary car reaching a speed of 60 miles per hour in five seconds. That's measurable in terms of speed and then the time dimension. What we will go ahead and do here is we'll break out uh, into smaller teams and uh, the team will discuss among themselves uh, three examples of measurable goals. So think of a feature or just think whatever you think is going to be relevant for the robot. And we will formulate those conversations uh, once we've come back. So just submit one response per breakout room. And as a prefix to the breakout, sorry, to the response, also prefix your breakout team. So that way, when we are discussing it, it's easy to find the responses. I'm going to ping the link to the uh, Google Sheet form here in a minute. And while I do that, Mr. Smith, are we ready to have the teams break out, say, for four minutes, three plus one? Yeah, absolutely. So as, as Jim just said, there's going to be a three-minute countdown timer. But remember, you still then have one more minute to wrap up your discussion before you return back to here. So. All right. Welcome back, team. Does any group want to go ahead? Just call out your room number if you don't mind, and then I'll try to highlight that response. Franklin, your group, do you want to go? Sure. So we chose the drivetrain, and for goal one, we said that it should be able to go from zero to 15 feet per second in three seconds, which is good mm -hmm. for maneuverability around the field. For our second one, and this is like um, a sustainability one, we said if our drivetrain is dropped from hangar height, so like if it was hanging on the top rung, then it would be able to be dropped with no damage. And then also a uh, software side, it should have non-locking field relative, which just makes it easier to drive around. Great, thank you. Let's see, I'm going to request somebody who has not spoken so far, Amar. Yeah, um, so for our first goal, uh, we said, wait, I'm sorry, I can't see it. Room number three, where are you? Can oh, you I don't think we, we didn't put uh, the room number in the- It looks one. like it's the bottom of the first group. This one? Yeah. Sorry, it's, it's a little small on my screen. I can't read it. It says- Sorry about that. Oh, uh, yeah. We, so we said we want the max speed of the shooter to reach uh, about 20 rotations per second. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And then for the next one, we said uh, we would want the shooter to be able to uh, get through four sh uh, three shots in four seconds. And then we would want to design the shooter to shoot uh, at least nine out of 10 balls into the hangar on average. Perfect. Thank you. Juven, try control. Oh, I'm sorry. I, was, yeah. I thought you were going to do that. I was going to say control plus might zoom in on those. Some. Um, yeah. But all good. They do, did the scroll bar, yeah. So I think we're good. I think in the interest of time, we'll move. So the idea was to drive home the message that we certainly need certain measurable goals. From here on, check. Uh, are you ready to share, Amiron? I am. Okay, perfect. 
You're muted. You're on mute, Jack. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, is it all good? You see? Yep, all set. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is our robot structure, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with our four captains, each leading their own different leads and then other positions under it, like scouting lead or uh, FLL mentor and chairman's presentation team through the awards lead and other things like that. And why do we have this is really what I want you guys to take away from this. And that is we want to make sure our team is organized so that we are able to have an effectively run team by leading from behind, which is something that is very critical to project management as a whole. And then the next thing we're going to be doing is going over a high level build schedule. And this is something that everyone may not be familiar with, but we hope you will be, as it is something that we're gonna be using a lot during our actual build season. And as you can see, we have an example one here with uh, each week and multiple different features, including the ones from last year of game design and innovation challenge. But really we want you to focus on window. that we have, hmm? pardon? Your example. I am not. Okay, but what you will see in a second is that there is a sheet with multiple different uh, these. Things on the left are the different sub teams, as you can see, along with different features, such as the turret and the swerve, the high goal shooter. And what each of these weeks are is they're the general area that the uh, feature will be working with, such as assembly or software, and pretty much where they are in their design process. And you will be doing one shortly uh, in breakout rooms. So things to keep in mind are some common strategies is starting with the end in mind, like filling out week six first and then working backwards to see what you need and how fast you'll have to be pushing yourself and what pace you're gonna need, gonna need to be at and not to be overwhelming different sub teams as in not having too many people going at the same week. And this can be one of the hardest challenges with a high level build season schedule but pretty much this is to give an overview to the team so we can help build our sprint goals, which is also something we will get into in later slides. So I think if we are ready, we can get people ready for their breakouts. Do you want uh, the same three plus one minutes? I think we'll need okay. five plus one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. All right. Here we go. All right. Now I think everybody is back. <laughs> hey, Jack, you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Okay. So as you can see, this is the current state of our um, breakout high level build season schedule. And um, besides a little formatting issues, we have pretty much everything filled out. But there are a few things that I would like to touch on with where we can improve this. And you can be seen in week five in particular. Uh, we got a lot in week three and also a lot in week two. And before I tell you guys what it is, does anybody want to guess about where we can improve on this 
schedule might be. Sam? Um, maybe because like software can't get to every single feature in one week, it has to kind of be spread out. That is exactly it. As you can see in week five, we have, I believe, five of our six features all being done on software testing. And Ayush is really good at software, but I don't think he can test five features at once without overworking a little too much. And what we really want to take away from this is that we have to space out where we have people working so that we don't overwhelm them and then block the critical path and stop us from being able to achieve what we need to, where we want to spread them out so that not or software isn't working on all the features at once when we could have electrical working on one or assembly working on one to lighten the load from software by state or by staggering when we have people working on them. And does anybody have any other ideas about how we can improve this? Double the size of the team. Now that would be very helpful. That is a little harder than moving some stuff around in a spreadsheet, but I appreciate the suggestion, Mr. John. And that is actually touches on another point of making sure that everybody is being trained during the preseason so that they are ready to be able to help build the features or not specifically build, but contribute towards the features depending on which sub team they have decided to join, which is also something that the team should keep in mind, just not specifically project management oriented. Um, mm -hmm. Similar to the software issue in week five, there seems to be a heavy um, load on mechanical during weeks one and two. That's very true. We have a lot the of our sub teams. Has, being... Mechanical has maybe 15 new members. We can handle it. We're good. <laughs> Okay, so mechanical we can overwhelm, but then software we'll have to lighten the load on. Is there a way to do some of the? Oh, sorry. Is there a way to do some of that testing earlier, and as the things are coming together? Yeah, it's a really good point that we could have other teams try and get things done faster, so then software can be testing some stuff in week four and not everything in week five. Okay, the next thing we wanna to touch on is the team availability sheet and kind of its importance with the team and how it's gonna be running for this season. So right now we have an example of a project management availability sheet with me and the four FPMs on there to give you a sense of what it might look like when it's all filled out. And the way it's made is based on time and when you'll be able to be at that meeting in particular. So for example, right here, this is me. Say I have a concert to go to, to play the violin and I can't be there from seven to eight, but Sam is only here to after six and Sam really needs to meet with me. Sam can go on the availability sheet and know that she can talk to me as soon as she gets there and doesn't wait till 7.30 and then feel rushed when we only have 30 minutes before we have to clean up at the end. And this is just one example of how this availability sheet can be useful. It is collapsible. So that can that is something that we can use to keep it uncluttered but some people might be opposed to the names. This allows for easy visualization of who's gonna be there to help really get it across the message of what's going on. And the next slide will be presented by Jubin. Sure, so I'm gonna go a little faster in the interest of time. So we do use our Agile methodology in general, and you're learning this, these great things right into the school time, during the school time, which is great. 
So what does Agile Manifesto say? It's the individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So we definitely have to interact with each other. We have to give importance to the individuals. We will also follow the process, say for example, the review process and the design review process. Then when the Agile methodology came about, it was focused on software, but now we can extend it to hardware too, like working feature over comprehensive documentation. Again, we will definitely do the documentation we need as for continuation and all other important aspects. In customer collaborations, our customer is going to be Aiden or the product owner. So talking to him, trying to express what's working, not working, and then trying to negotiate will be important. But however, collaborating with what's working with him for what's working or not working will be key for him to make decisions. And then for responding to change or following a plan. So though we have a six weeks plan, we will definitely pivot based on the needs. We'll respond to the constraints, to the features that we develop. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. So under the agile methodology, there are different frameworks or different processes. So we use the Scrum framework. It's a lightweight agile framework. Uh, what's there on the right hand side? It talks about the sprint, the one in the blue color. So it's the six weeks that we have, which we will call either week one or sprint one. So we do few repetitive activities like review what's been done in the previous uh, week, build or develop or add or uh, say build a part for the feature. We will test it. And then in the week, end of the week, we will do the plan for what we need to do for the uh, upcoming week, right? The key players who are as part of the Scrum team or the Scrum team, which is the whole team, the Scrum master in our case will be the feature project manager and then the product owner, say Aiden as an example, right? So we split ourselves into smaller cross-functional teams to the best extent possible. So the smaller we are, it's easy to uh, organize ourselves to achieve our goals for the feature and hence the robot. We'll also split our work into smaller stories, which we will cover during the Trello exercise. So however small we make our uh, stories and us, it's easy to divide and conquer. So please uh, try to split your work. It's easy to share different items across different team members or participating team members. Thank you, Jack. Next slide, please. So just to reiterate, Agile is the mindset and the Scrum is the framework we follow. Over to you, Jack. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jubin. And the way that Huskies actually implement this is through sprints and Trello and FPMs. And this is our framework on the bottom left. It starts with our six weeks high with our six week high level build season plan, which you all helped participate build one today. And then we get into the project backlog. This is where we take everything in that build plan and make different stories about it. And we go through those stories during our sprint planning meeting and we put them into our sprint backlog, which is everything we want to accomplish for that week. And it is based off the sprint goals, which um, also come from the six week plan about where we want to be with the team. And we break it up into tasks within the story, which is kind of the scrum master versus the scrum team like Juven was talking about. And that all gets done at Husky Robotics. We put things in the done list. We review them at the Saturday planning meeting and we repeat the process until we've made it through all of our sprints and assembled our robot. Um, so every day, um, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with how a meeting goes. At three, we catch everyone up and we share our goals. We point people in the right direction so they are able to accomplish good stuff during our meetings. And then we have our standups to notify people even further about what's going on mid-meeting and the FPMs help support people while they're working. Okay, so Trello is something that we want to highlight because it is very important for project management and it is not a true Scrum framework, but it is what we use as our team to help us achieve what we need to. And I'm having some trouble getting into Trello Hello, but I'm sure you've all seen the board. We have multiple different lists to keep everything organized. And 
now we have our last slide. So does anybody want to tell me what they see on the left versus what they see on the right? On the left, I see an entire wide target of which you can get a huge variety of scores. And on the right, I see a singular defined number. Yes, thank you. That is exactly what I was going for. On the left, you have a lot in the picture. You can see multiple different things, whatever your eyes focused on, whether it was the lamps in the corners or maybe the brick pattern or any of the numbers on the outside. But on the right, it is honed in. It is looking directly at the center of the bullseye. And that is really what we want our team to be doing. If we want to achieve getting to worlds, we want to be focused completely on worlds with our sight set on how we're going to be able to be a high performing and highly participative team that can get us to worlds. So our talk today is um, failure and failure mode analysis. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody, um, especially the, uh, the new members of the team. Um, <clears throat> we'll get rolling here. Sorry, I have a little setup here that I wasn't ready for. Um, reference information. So a lot of this uh, is taken from system reliability theory by uh, Marvin Roussan. Um, so um, wherever I've um, referenced something off the internet, I've tried to put it in line. The the links um, there's a lot of there's a lot of good information from from the slides related to the book by the author. Um, so uh, I. I myself, I'm going to get this book. I don't actually have it. I just got it off the internet. All right, a little trouble here. Um, so what is failure mode analysis? So it's a method to identify and analyze um, potential failure modes of various parts of the system. And by system, we're going to see that that's not like necessarily the whole system. It could be a subsystem or a component, uh, but it's the system you're focusing on. The effects of these failures may have on the system and how to avoid and or mitigate the effects of the critical failures. So we're gonna be focusing in on criticality on this. So why did this replace risk management training, which was what we did the last couple of years. And um, we talked about this when we were planning out the leadership um, presentations. And it, identifying the risks is the biggest hurdle in applying risk management techniques. Um, and the failure mode analysis helps us to focus right in on risk identification. That's the, the first thing you do. Okay, it's pretty close to the first thing you do. You figure out your, your system and you break it down into pieces. And then you go right into how can this thing break? And uh, try to work out why it might break and go from there. So you're trying to um, identify and mitigate or eliminate the negative outcomes. And at the bottom, I put what a risk is from last year. Um, and it's an uncertainty um, that if it occurs has a negative effect on what your goals are. Um, so safety and reliability improvements are a specific goal of failure mode analysis and system failure is the metric for ranking and identifying the improvements. So it really helps to focus your thinking on what could go wrong and how do I maybe change things so that it doesn't go wrong. And if it does go wrong, um, can we make it not be so bad? Um, so we're still gonna apply risk management techniques to reduce or eliminate negative outcomes in other areas, but for, especially for um, robot design, technical design, um, I think that failure mode analysis will help. So why do it is from the what that we just had in the previous is to mitigate the effects of, of failures on team performance. And we see failures um, in our, our recent tournaments. Um, and could some of those been avoided? And I think we'll see that, yeah, some of them probably could have been. Um, so the focus today is on robot tournament performance as the key metric. But how do we do it? So we use as a process, FAMICA or FAMIA. Um, these days they're kind of interchangeable. Um, they both have criticality in them, even though it's not spelled out, that's the C. Um, and it's uh, the technique for identifying and prioritizing 
what sh what failures you would like to eliminate or reduce in your um, in your system, um, and it's in the design process. So uh, it's also an iterative process. So you can go through this process, come up with your mitigations, reevaluate, and decide whether or not you're really done. Um, and Semitech, that was a co consortium of uh, semiconductor manufacturers um, a while back. Um, so their goal of using Famica is to resolve potential problems in a system before they occur. Um, and uh, Omdahl, it's more about um, identifying, prioritizing, reducing the effect before it reaches a customer. So a little different take on the goal of this thing. So we said failure analysis and failure mode analysis. So Famica can be used as a process for failure mode analysis, which is really an activity to avoid future failures. So we haven't designed the robot yet, or we have a concept or an architecture for a robot, we kind of have an idea. You can actually start working on Famica. Failure analysis is after the fact. Okay, we had a Robo Rio fail in Houston, right? So um, maybe we want to find out why that was and do something about it. So you use problem solving techniques in both approaches to, um, to resolve the design issues that prevent us from meeting our requirement goals. So Famica is not perfect. You're not going to find necessarily everything. Probably not. We have limited time, uh, but that's kind of the goal: is to focus your time, try and eliminate um, the failure modes that you can, and then use failure analysis um, on the ones that remain and problem solve to uh, improve on those. And um, as a team, for the second game that we play, you um, institutionally remember that so that going forward, you can roll that into your best known methods, BKMs, and improve the team every year as you go forward. And then an another topic is diagnostics and diagnosability. So it's uh, different from, but often key to failure analysis. So how do you figure out quickly what the problem is? Um, and um, how do you figure out when you do have a problem? Like, um, you know, if something something fails, we'll 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 talk about the RoboTier Rumble. Um, when something fails, how do you fix fix it quickly? So diagnostics can help you do that, and the di diagnosability of your system. What kind of software tools have you built into it? Um, but if we have tools that are good for diagnostics and diagnosability they can also help us provide data for failure analysis and failure mode analysis. So uh, at Robotier Rumble, uh, the balls would not automatically feed. Um, and actually, I have a question for the drive team um, while I'm going through this at the end. If any of you could comment, um, were you able to see this problem due to something you saw on your on your screen on the dashboard or was it something that you were able to infer by the way that the robot was behaving um, but they they did correctly assess the situation and mitigated with a manual feed um, the blue sensor up here on the right um, was not tight and so it had shifted towards the right on your screen it had shifted over here and it was looking at this belt and it thought that that was a ball and so it's thought there was a ball in it that it couldn't feed it anymore. So they were able to slowly get one ball at a time and shoot. It was less than half effective at the normal number of balls that we would shoot. Um, but that's a mitigation. It's an important thing to remember. It's like, oh, if this, we try not to have this failure happen, but if it does happen, what do we do about it? Um, and in the pits, the diagnosability was fantastic. Software immediately set up a dive panel showing the sensors. And the students were sticking their hands in there and finding that, oh, that one is just always on. Um, Declan's going, that's not where it normally is because I can see the little pattern where it goes. And we moved it back and everything was happy. Oh, but it was loose, so it got tightened. Um, so... Um, those are the sorts of things that you can pull out of failure analysis. This was a failure. This was a failure analysis. Um, perhaps there's a maintenance on these kinds of sensors, right? That you will go, okay, every match, I want to make sure they're tight. Maybe it's not every match. 
I mean, these things have been in there for a long time. We didn't really have a problem with them. So maybe it's like every tournament before you go, or maybe every day at a tournament. Uh, but you can come up with those kinds of things and go, okay, we're going to make sure that those are tight. Um, and another thing was um, he could see where it was supposed to go. And so that's kind of cool. Once it gets adjusted, perhaps there's some, because it is nice that they're adjustable in case you wanted to change something. Um, you know, maybe there needs to be like a, a mark that you just put on there, like a Sharpie or something that says this is where they go back in case they ever get jarred because, you know, we get hit by a robot really hard or something. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, failure mode analysis is looking ahead. Failure analysis is really looking at what's already happened. And diagnostics is really helpful, helpful for both. Um, so let's pause for any questions at this point, because um, I'm a. I think we're kind of tight on time, so I want to go as fast as I can. But definitely, um, if you have any questions, just uh, unmute yourself and ask. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. Generally speaking, how how much how many diagnostics and analyses are in play at any given time? Like how many backup plans do we have? Well, that's a tough question. Um, we have some new tools. Um, Mr. Schmidt, what was that called? Um, advantage Kit and Advantage Scope. Thank you. Um, that allows us to log a tremendous amount of data so that if something goes wrong, you can go back and have a look at it. And if you were missing something, Mr. Schmidt was sharing with me that you can even go back, add the thing that you were missing, put it into simulator mode and simulate that match, and then potentially get out the information that's hidden um, or wasn't recorded at all. So with, with that sort of a system, you can, really cover your bases and, and really with experience have a pretty good chance of having all the data that you need, like the gyro, the, the motor uh, pose, the, the steering pose for the, for the um, swerve drive and what was the speed it was going. And, you know, there was um, at Roboteer Rumble, we had a, a pigeon problem um, actually related to the diagnostics. So that's, uh, that's interesting um, because it was new. Um, and there was a bug in it. So there was, it's complicated, but it, it would just immediately go the wrong direction and then come back again. So that's a case where, um, you know, your question about how much do you haven't played any one time, you want to make sure that the diagnostics isn't the cause of your failure. And in industry, that's a question that comes up when you start adding diagnostics and adding diagnostics. If you're actually throwing hardware at it, or making the software unreasonably complicated to have all of this diagnostics, at some point there's a diminishing return because the added complexity causes failures. Um, in this case, it's, um, you know, once we get a handle on that advantage kit, and advantage scope, um, it's gonna be tested pretty thoroughly just in the, in the, you know, in the course of testing our robot. Uh, and it'll be, I'm 100% sure it's gonna be a net win to help us out. Um, so most of the diagnostics are probably going to be software. And so, yeah, you, you can't completely clutter up your screen and then you can't see what's going on. So it is a balancing act. I can't, couldn't, no way give you an answer about a number. Does that answer your question? But Dennis, and part of it too, is that first bullet item, the failure analysis is trying to figure out beforehand mm -hmm. what things could go wrong. Yeah. So that um, you have that in mind, you have some of the um, potential fixes, or you know what to do in you know in the moment when when something's not going wrong to get through it before you can what, until you get the time to be able to look at the data and do something. If you know, so if something happens during a match, you have a plan um, for what might have you know what might fail, what might you do to get through that match before you can get back and fix it. That's right. Yes. So, it kind of plays together a little bit. That's right. Thanks. So, do you use Famicas at work, or Famias? Me? Yeah. 
Yeah, they call it typically it's called HAZOPS, which is the sort of thing like a hazard analysis. So it's the same same concept. Um, so for us, we're looking at what could fail, what could go wrong in a in a process system, you know, pipelines burst or you know whatever. But it's the same sort of thing. But it's more of a planning thing. We do have we do have um, uh, FMEAs after the fact when we're analyzing what may have happened like when there was the big cold winter event last year and a lot of power plants and things froze up mm -hmm. um and trying to figure out how to prevent that from happening again um but there's also a lot of that is done in the design phase beforehand to make sure it's in your design so you have a plan you have programs in place and um procedures for postulated events that probably will never happen, but you want to be able to, to deal with them if they do. Right, right. So one of the um, uh, one of the points we're going to look at is the uh, um, the the occurrences. Um, it's not just robot failures; it's also safety, and those are the two that we care about, and we care about safety the most. So um, most of the time, it, you know, things are pretty safe, but we do want to think about what could go wrong that could hurt somebody. Um, so let's do a breakout. We're going to, we were going to do longer, but we're going to do uh, four minutes um, and identify one or more cases from your experience. I'll drop this in the chat as well, uh, where our team could have or did benefit from any of those activities. So failure mode analysis, um, Mitigating a failure found during testing or tournament play, which would be failure analysis, and then uh, using diagnostics to debug a design or debug a complex problem. Um, so please uh, report, nominate someone to report back um, your group's most compelling case. And you don't have to do all three of these, just you know, pick one, and we'll try to get through a couple of them. Is there any? Are there any volunteers to report back? Oh, okay. I see Jack and Simi and Aiden. All right, I think Jack was first. Yeah, so what our team really talks about was we wanted to focus on the failure, or really Jesse pointed out that we should choose a failure that has happened. We chose the chain breaking and we identified having a better way to measure chain tension would help us anticipate and diagnose. It was like a double dip, but it would help all around making sure that our chain doesn't break and is more sustainable for the future use in our robots. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Simi? Um, I remember last year at Worlds, we realized that the robot when it was climbing was swinging in a way that was not good for the the chain and the way that it was being uh, bolted into the elevator and right. so the um the connecting bar in the elevator was twisting because of that and so we found that problem very quickly and what we had to do in the pits was quickly machine um another piece with the extra stock that we had and attach it to like lengthen that connecting bar to uh, help it Mm -hmm. uh, keep climbing. So that was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that was a great fix. I love the CAD drawing that we had, which was just a terrible cartoon by by um, Spitzner. <laughs> uh, Aiden? Um, we talked about a time where we could have better anticipated failure. And that was when like anticipating limelight failure. Um, and mm -hmm. when it did fail, we didn't have like uh, as many um, presets as we could have uh so then after that match we uh, added a button to like turn off limelight so that gave us more options when we were shooting yeah yeah that's a good one thanks uh olivia yeah what my group talked about was um the recent failures we've had with equipment in the machining shop and the mills that have been breaking so we've been talking about how we've mitigated that since we fixed the problem so the issue with our most recent mill was the way we were taking out um, the bits was just damaging to a very specific part inside the mill. So instead of um, dropping a drop bar, which um, can cause damage, we've started hitting with a hammer. So just some ways we've mitigated it as a subteam. I love that the solution was using a hammer. All right, thank you everyone.
All right. So Famica is usually uh, during concept and initial design um, to make sure that all the potential failures, failure modes have been considered. Doesn't mean that they're all going to be addressed. Um, you want to identify the severity of the failures because um, the criticality is important that we focus our time on what's important. Um, and then proper provisions have been made to eliminate these failures. Um, and it's also used to provide some historical documentation for future, re future reference and failure analysis, um, a basis for maintenance planning, for example, that sensor or something else that might need to be tightened or lubed or whatever it is. Um, and then probably not so much for us, but it can be a basis for quantitative reliability and availability analysis like MTBF, MTTR, MT, mean time between failures, uh, time to repair, things like that. Uh, and probably our um, most valuable asset is time. Um, so the sooner you can find these problems, the biggest impact and the lowest cost it's going to be. So the process uh, for Famica is preparation, um, gather your information, uh, define the boundaries of the system, um, the functional requirements, the interfaces, um, you know, gathering drawing specs, et cetera, um, and then collecting information about similar designs, and then a structural analysis of um, the system into manageable units, functional elements, et cetera. So we'll get into that in a little bit more. Um, so divide as coarsely as possible so you don't have so many systems to go through, but I think our systems are gonna, our robot is gonna naturally divide itself up into um, chunks that make sense. And there's a little bit of overlap. Um, actually, let's let's throw out a couple of things. So what do you guys think? Um, in fact, just unmute yourself and just start talking because we don't we don't have a lot of time. Um, just let's go a few of them. Uh, what do you think are some of the manageable units that we might run a Famica on in a robot? Features. Uh, features are requirements. Oh, I see what you mean. Features such as. Yeah. What you're saying is whenever we have a feature like a, can you throw one out there? Climber? Climber. Yeah, like a climber. Um, a drivetrain? I might even say each individual system within that feature. Like the, okay. the, like the chains within the climber. Yeah, that's where uh, you were keeping it coarse is probably a good idea. You wouldn't drop all the way down to the chains, probably. Um, you would probably keep it to the climber level. And then the oh. chain would be something within the climber. And then the chain itself can have, you know, if you've got subcomponents on that, like, oh, well, you know, the way that we attach it is important, like was brought up previously, or the way that we do our links, uh, lubrication, um, uh, what, whatever it might be, right? Protecting it from nuts and bolts falling down into the gears might be important. So, okay, thanks. Um, what I did want to bring up is uh, something like, would you do electrical? Yes. Pardon? Yes, you probably would. Electrical is kind of this, it's got some global and some local stuff to it, right? Um, it's not really a feature. I mean, right, we always have electrical um, or pneumatics could be another thing where you might just look at electrical failures, pneumatic failures, right, as separate pieces, even though they kind of touch maybe all, all of the, the features, right? Certainly electrical does. All right. So you do this structural analysis so that you can break it down into chunks so that you can do the, then do the analysis. Um, you'll do a team review, um, and it loops back. So you do your, you figure out your corrective actions. You, then you're going to review it again and decide, okay, is this thing good enough, or do I need to go back um, and do more corrective actions? So there's a, a worksheet for doing this, um, and I'm just going to open the worksheet, and we'll go through a few things there. Um, there it is. Okay. So I put this together 
based on a bunch of them that I had seen and tried to simplify it as much as possible. I know it doesn't seem that simple, um, but you've got your system, your owner, some like if it's a feature, the feature program manager is probably going to be the owner. Um, when you you did this, all your reference information, you blow this thing out as much as you need to get the information in there. This is just a template. Um, reference number is when we go back to say, hey, like maybe in Trello, you say, hey, we're um, we're really, really interested in this particular failure mode that we are certain we need to address. And so that might be on a sprint even, right? So when we fix, when when we identify things, that's work that has to be done. And so it has to go into project management to get it planned out. Um, so uh, the function, so drivetrain, electronics, collector, climber, pneumatics, uh, operational mode, idle, autonomous, teleoperated, disabled, field or robot relative, for maybe for the swerve drives, X mode, things like that. Uh, failure mode is basically a non-fulfillment of the functional requirements. So it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It, it failed. And what could be the causes of that failure? So one example is uh, a loss of power. That was, <laughs> that happened uh, at our last uh, tournament. Um, so was it overcurrent? Was it a breaker failure? Um, was it the power hub? Um, another robot contacted our breaker button. So, you know, that's a that's a pretty good example of power failure. What, what could happen? How would we want to protect against it? Um, there, we could talk a long time about that particular incident, um, which we probably should, but not today. Um, detection of the failure. This is one of the one of the, the parameters that you use to figure out the criticality. I'm just going to jump over here to um, RPN and, and this column here, which is the risk priority number, which is the product of S, zero, and D. And at the bottom here, you see tabs for severity, occurrence, and detection. So since, since we're kind of running out of time, I'll let you guys play with this spreadsheet on your own. We're going to, we'll post it. Um, so you've got the detection of failure, um, occurrence rate, which is kind of a frequency, and then the severity, which is like, you know, probably falling off of while climbing on the, the top rung, that would have a very high severity rating. <laughs> um, and so you take the product is one way to do it. So you can do it with the risk priority number, or you can do it with the criticality number. I'm in a meeting. Okay. Um, because a lot of times the, um, the, the people filling out these forms have a hard time putting a number on the diagnosability. So um, if you use all three, you use the RPN matrix. If you're only using the criticality number, um, you don't really have the diagnosability in here. But um, for all of these guys, a low number is good. So if you're down here at one and one, the occurrence is low, the severity is low. Remind you of uh, risk management? It's because this is a risk, uh, a risk management matrix and uh, a decision matrix. And so um, as those numbers go up, it's more and more important that you address those. So this one um, is um, essentially severity versus occurrence times diagnosability. It's kind of a weird chart because they didn't want to make 3D out of it. Um, so anyway, you can you can put it through the numbers and then you know decide that I'm gonna do my reds, I'm not gonna do my greens, or I might do the greens on the border. Okay. So this is all filled out probably by the feature manager and uh, um, those on their team. And then when you do the review, you come up with the corrective actions. Um, it doesn't need a corrective action. It throws up on me here. Um, and then decide whether or not that's enough and, th and that the, the risk is low enough that you're going to just go with that corrective action and now it's, it's corrected, if you will. Okay. Um, keep going. Oh, and I'm ahead of myself. All right, we talked about that. Um, so I wanted to go through a real life example. I think we have enough time. 
So the Robo Rio, Rio failure in Houston. This is a very good case study on what we're going through today. So uh, we quickly diagnosed and repaired the problem. There was a missing se sensor power. Um, we could see there was no power LED on the sensor. Then measured the 5 volt power was dead using a multimeter. Swapped the Robo Rio and swapped the SD card into it. So we had spares and knew how to replace them. That was great. Um, and the guidance on the spot was, please place this broken Robo Rio into a Ziploc bag for analysis when we get back to Naperville, okay? So diagnosability was high. Probability of a Robo Rio failure is, should be very low, but it was because we hadn't protected it. The failure probability was actually pretty high and surprising it had waited this long to give it up. Um, so we're going to do failure analysis on this thing to figure out what the real problem is. Theory was conductive debris in the IO pins. Actual theory was correct. Vacuuming out the board cleared the short. So uh, failure mode was identified, debris in the IO pin. So a cover is required for 2023. If we design that cover properly, we probably won't have any problem. We also have to, but when we go through those reviews, then you might come up with another question. Like, if we put a cover on the thing, is it going to overheat? So you want to continually question, well, what else could happen? What else could happen? Um, or if we make that fix, does that cause some other unintended side effect, right? So um, I thought that was a, a, a great example for what we want to try to do. Try to predict. Um, and then when things do go wrong, do the best job you can to um, modify the design either on this robot um, or on the next one so that that doesn't happen again. So to recap, failure mode is looking forward. Failure analysis is looking at what you got and looking at past history. And then diagnostics helps you with both. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, are there any questions before we close this out? Because I think we're just a little bit over. Oh, right on time. And our next one will be vision and goals on the 21st of November. Well, a huge thank you to Juven and Elena and Jack and Mr. MG uh, for sharing their wisdom tonight. Um, we will get the, the spreadsheet and these resources um, shared out in the announcements chat, um, either tonight or uh, tomorrow, once we get everything uploaded to the right places. But uh, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>